So let's start the class. So you you did well for the test. Okay, I've seen worse. And uh, remember that um, what matters is the later, right? The, the the letter that you see, not the number that you see for the final grade, because my uh, grading scheme like is very friendly. So you want to look at the letter, not the number. Okay. So let's uh, keep going. We were doing electrostatics. Um, so we stopped here, you see? So when you have two insulators, so non-conducting material, so for example, it could be hair and a balloon, or it could be glass and silk, okay? Because they are not conducting, it means you cannot, if you apply a voltage, electricity will not flow. Hello, hello. Okay, but if you have non-conducting material and you rub them one against each other, so you are doing work, okay? And the work that you are doing is used to separate the charge, okay? So one will become negatively charged and the other one will become positively charged. So typical question for test number two, if you rub a balloon okay, against your hair, the balloon will become negatively charged, your hair will become positively charged, so that's why the hair will uh, go up, you know, because uh, all, all the positive charges will repel each other. So if you have typical hair and balloon or ebonite, okay, the ebonite or the balloon will have more affinity for the electrons. Okay, so the balloon becomes negatively charged and the hair will become positively, positively charged. However, you see that the charges cannot spread all over. Okay, they will stay wherever they are placed. Now, if you have silk and glass, it will be the opposite. Silk has more affinity for electrons, so it will take the electrons from the glass, and the silk will become negatively charged, and the glass will become positively charged. So there is a transfer of charge. However, the charge cannot spread all over because it's not a conductor. Okay, so there are so many demos you can do if you want to do demo. But for example, here you see you have a balloon, I'm doing work, I'm going to do work, okay? I'm picking up some electrons, but you see these electrons, they don't spread out, they can't, okay? Because when you have an insulator, non-conducting material, the electrons, they are not free to move. They cannot move, okay? It's not like a conductor. Is that clear? And you see here, uh, I bring the balloon close to the wall, so the wall is made of molecules, okay? The wall is non-conducting. So it means the electrons, they cannot move all the way far away, okay? They just move a tiny bit, but they cannot leave the molecule. So this is called polarization, okay? So you are pushing the electrons away, but you cannot push them all the way because it's not a conductor. Only inside the conductor, the electrons can move away from each other. And if you apply a voltage, the electrons can flow and you have electricity flowing. Is that clear? So you have this uh, cute simulation. He's rubbing the, the foot against the carpet here. So he's doing work because he's applying a force over a distance. This work, so this energy is used to transfer electrons from from the floor to to him but because he's a conductor in that case you see the electrons they don't stay on the the foot here they can move they will move because he's a conductor he's a he's made of conducting material so it's all juicy inside and they will move away from each other as far as possible right it's because you're a conductor so for a conductor, you cannot have charges staying inside, okay? If you charge a conductor, it will move away from each other as much as possible. 
And what do these chargers want? They want to go to the ground, right? So if you do this... Ouch. So what you are doing here is called the breakdown of the electric field. It means that the voltage, okay, the voltage between his finger and the floor is so high. There is such a high voltage that you're going to have the... Um, Ionize, you, you're gonna ionize the air and current can flow. So you can close the circuit. Is that clear? So that's how it works. Okay, so we did that. Um, I wanted to emphasize that everything we're gonna learn and have learned is very important for biology. So I don't know if you know that website, I decided to put that link in Canvas because it seems very interesting for students in biology, like most of you. But here they explain what is an action potential. So the way a signal will move uh, through neurons, for example, so we we have an electrical sig a system inside us. The way it's moving, it's not like electricity flowing. It's a change in voltage that will propagate. So, for example, if if this is the neuron, so this is inside the cell, and this is outside the cell. Okay, you have learned that in uh, biology, right? Didn't you? Okay, and you have a membrane here. And you see here it's a resting state, so the neuron is not fired. Okay, in a resting state, you see the voltage here is lower than the voltage there. And then when there is a signal moving, maybe you touch something very hot and you remove your hand, that because there was a signal that was sent from your fingers through the neurons to your brain. So you know you have to remove your hand, right? So the way it works is that those uh, little ions, okay, they will move. So you, you have some, I don't know, don't ask me how it works, I'm not sure. But you have some chemical sending a message, messenger, and you see they move, these channels will open, and then it will change the voltage. So the voltage will change like this, right? And it will propagate through the neurons. So for the cells inside our body, so through, uh, through the neurons, it will be sodium that will move in and out to create that potential change. So this is called an action potential. And I was reading that for the heart, so for the heart, let me ask you something. How does it work for the heart? It's not the sodium here that goes in and out. It will be the... Start with a C and with a A, calcium, okay? So the same idea, the same principle, but in the heart, it's the calcium going in and out, in and out. So that's why the heart, okay, has a conduction system, okay? Because a, an electric signal can move from one part of the heart to the other part of the heart, okay? It's not that I know much about it. I just read <laughs> recently about the conduction system of the heart. I didn't know. But you see, the electric signal can move, and it's not electricity. Okay? It's the change in voltage that will move. And I, I learned that um, if the conduction system doesn't work properly, that's when you get um, what is called me, myo. Thank you, myocarditis because it's an inflammation of the myocardium. Thank you. Okay, so you see how it connects to what we have uh, learned. So it's an inflammation. inflammation. Okay, so super interesting. So I did a demo here. You see, if you have a light charge, it's gonna attract each other. And um, Unlike charge, attract, like charge, repel each other. Okay, so we did the demo about that. We did that. So now if you have a conductor, now the electrons. Oh, okay. Another thing, like typical conceptual question, only the electrons can move. Okay, the, the, the positive charges, it's like the nuclei missing electrons. So they cannot move. Only the electrons will move. So if the electrons are leaving, 
it will become positive. If something gain electron, it will become positive. So for example, uh, Ca plus, what happened? It, it, Ca plus, did it lose or did it gain? Lose electrons, right? That's how you have all those uh, electrolytes. But, um, so here you have a conductor and it's called charging by contact. So not only the electrons will be able to move in a conducting material, but they will do so in such a way they're going to spread out only on the outside, as far as possible from each other. And you cannot have a charge inside the conductor. Okay, so that's the famous story. If you if there is lightning outside, you're gonna be safe inside your car because the charge cannot go inside. It will always move on the outside. You just have to be careful because if your car was uh, um, uh, struck by lightning, if you go outside, you touch your chassis of the car and you step in water, that that's not good because you you will be uh, touching the ground. Okay, so you have to be careful with that. So um, anyway, so I want to show you that. So here is like an electrostatic machine. It's called a fly stick. You know, if you want to, to do a demo, it's very cheap on, uh, on the internet. It's uh, very, very smart. So it's a mini electrostatic machine. And what it does, I don't know if you can hear some noise coming from there. In okay, case so you have a motor inside, so you have some rubbing happening, so it will separate the charge. So maybe here it will become positive, and here it's going to be negative. And here I have a, an electroscope. So is it a conductor or not? Yes, okay, because it's made of metal, and those lo those leaves here they can move, right? So, so if I touch it, what's going to happen to it? M move away from each other. Because the electrons, it's not like the balloon. If I touch that, the electrons are not going to stay here. Okay, It will spread out away from each other. So only this part is uh, conducting. Here I have some kind of varnish that will insulate. So it's not a conductor here, but this is a conductor. So the electrons will repel each other. Okay, so you can see here. No, you cannot see. I have a issue. Let's see, I have to do it. That's, that's the risk that you take when you do want to do the more. Okay, let's see if it works. Ah. Let's do this one. Oh, you know what? Because I'm grounding it, that's why. Oops. Do you see that? So, what, what, okay, let, let's think about it. Why it didn't work the first time? Where did I put my hand? Here. And it means what? It means it is a conductor. Because what did the charge uh, do? Where I got the one from me into the ground. Okay, so you see, this is called a capacitor because it can hold the charge. I can store charge here, right, for a very long time. If the air is dry, it can stay here for a very long time. If it's humid, it will leak out. So what's going to happen if I touch it? Oops. Right? It's going to go through me, because I'm a conductor, into the ground. So the, the, the electrons always want to go to the ground. Is that clear? I can show you what is, um, what is polarization. So you see, this is what a conductor, right? Do you all agree with that? Now, if I bring that close to it, do you see how it's attracted? Okay, so this is called polarization. It means that if this is negative here, that will become what? Positive, and the other side will become negative. Why? Because it's a conductor, okay? 
So in that case, the electrons will be able to move as far as they can. And you see, this is called polarization, also called charging by induction. This part will be positive, the other part will be negative. So I have a, like a dipole. What do you think is going to happen if I touch it? Okay, so yes, yes, so this is negative. So if I touch it, it will become. No, if I touch it, this is negative, this is neutral. So if I touch it, the it will be negative, right? Because some of the electrons, they say, oh, okay, there is more space to move away from each other, we hate each other, right? So that will become negative, this is negative, so what's going to happen? The repel, right? Let's see. It's just, I have to touch it. But it's uh, full of static everywhere, so let's see if I can do it with this one. Ah, 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 look at that, look at that, can you see it? Ah, did you see what happened at the top? It was grounded, right? Now I can do also, um, I can charge by induction, so I'm going to charge here. Make it charge. And now if I take this, I'm not touching it, but you see how it's going to move. Do you see how it kind of move away? Okay, so it's like charging by induction. So moving away. So let's see if I can, uh, let's see if it works. Can you be a volunteer? Can you touch it if you see, if you feel something? A little bit, little bit, right? So there are many demos that you can do. This is called the fly stick. It's very cheap. Okay, any question? And uh, I have uploaded in my in my website. I have uploaded a demo as well. So this is called the Van Graaff generator. Have you seen those? Yeah. Right, you did? It, it was developed in the 40s, okay, in um, 30s, sorry, at MIT, okay? And it was used for, as a particle accelerator. So it was huge at the time here, okay? So it's like my fly stick, except it's huge, but it worked exactly the same way. You have a motor at in, inside the base, you have rubbing happening, okay? So charges will separate. And now you see the charge here goes here. There is a brush touching the dome. So the dome is a conducting material. So can the charge stay inside the conductor? Or it's always moving on the outside? outside. So what's going to happen? You're going to build up a huge, not a huge amount of charge, but some charges. Okay. So now you have a voltage. You can have up to 100,000 volt voltage relative to the ground. However, it will be safe. You can, you can touch it. Okay. We do all those demos where people, uh, students will touch it. So what do you think? Is she connected to the ground or is she isolated? If she was connected to the ground, the charge will not stay, right? But you see how the hair are uh, repelling each other? So it means she is, is insulated, okay? She, that means she step on some kind of rubber or maybe she step on the chair. So she's insulated from the tip, from, from the ground. And she will be safe, okay? She can be at 1000 volt, okay? First of all, as soon as she doesn't make the path to the ground, she will be safe, okay? So it means, uh, for example, uh, on the high tension lines, you, you have birds, right? The, the high tension lines, they are at 100,000 volt and the birds, they don't get fried. 
okay, or the squirrel don't get fried. This is because even though the squirrel is a hundred thousand volt, even though the squirrel has all these charges, right? It doesn't touch the ground, okay? So it won't be electrocuted, although it happens by accident. Uh, you know, a squirrel has a long tail, so if uh, the squirrel touches uh, both the line and, and the pole, for example, then it will be fried. And sometimes you see on the floor, you know, <laughs> fried squirrels. So, but uh, that's the idea. Okay, so that's called a Van Graaf generator. Okay, and, and you can do all those very fun demos. So I'll uh, show you one. You ready? Are you nervous? So those here, it's a big one, right? So maybe a hundred thousand volt. So, and uh, so do you think it can hold a lot of charges? Not really, right? And remember, energy is voltage times current. So even though the voltage is very high, let's say you touch, you touch it, so you make a path to the ground, you will not die. Why? because even though the voltage is very large, the amount of charges that it can store is very, 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 very small. So the energy will be very small because remember energy is voltage times the current, okay? That for one second. So it's not deadly, except if you have a um, pace, uh, pacemaker. See you. So he's, he's, acting. he's acting, okay? He knows very well that it's not dangerous. But you see how it's uh, insulated from the ground, okay? So if this is at 100,000 volt, he's going to be at 100,000 volt, right? And all the charges, right? Here you have a motor, so you separate the charges. Let's say it's electrons going up. All those electrons are going to spread out as much as possible. And then here you have... The, these electrons have an opportunity and they spread out as much as possible. That's why the hairs are supposed to repel each other. So let's see. So look at the tinsels. <laughs> and try not to look at me, please. <laughs> Go ahead. Ooh, yeah. I am now a living electroscope. <laughs> If the, um, if the weather is cooperating today, and if I had long hair, you might even see that my hair would start to act like an electroscope. We can try that too. Why don't you throw it? Is it working? So you see what's happening? So if this is negative charge, all the electrons will move, you know, outside his body and all the hair here will repel each other. And if he steps down, he will be shocked, but it will not die because you don't have enough current, okay? You don't have enough charges that you can collect inside here or outside there. So um, let's see, I found also this one is very cool. So you, saw, you see those pencil? So it's a pencil uh, trace here. Okay, Pen you, you know what is inside a pencil? It's made of what? Graphite and graphite is a conductor. Yes, right? So you see when it's gonna discharge, it's gonna discharge because it sees that there is a path to the ground. So it's gonna follow the trace of the pencil up to his hand and into the ground. So this is a crank one, so it's a cheaper one. You see that?
Now it does not need to touch it, okay? Because the voltage here, so the voltage here is zero because it's grounded. The voltage here is maybe 1000 volt. So the voltage is so large that it will ionize the air and you have a mini spark, mini lightning. That's what you have when you have lightning. Boom. So that's cool. So I used to do something with my students, but here I have, like when I was in a, at another school with uh, less students, 15 students. Ladies and gentlemen, here we are. It's 2021 and all of my students are yet again. So all those students are on, on the table. So are they insulated? Yes. So are they going to be shocked? No. Okay, because there is no path to the ground. I guess that was holding hands and they just love each other so much. Oh, wait, no. So it means he's going to be charged, but the charge will spread out all over to all the students and the charges will stay outside the body, right? The, it, the charges will be in great uh, despair to find the path to the ground. Josh is holding us at a 500,000 volt charge. And now Mark's hair is starting to go. And so Alex is going to give him a... So what's going to happen? He's going to touch him. Is everyone will get shocked. Because now there is a path to the ground, right? A fist bump and everybody is going to be so happy. Alex, whenever you are ready, go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, here. You see? So what they use, I would like to buy one for this class. I don't know. It's a, it's a cheaper, cheaper one. It's a crank one. Okay, so you're doing war um, with your hand instead of using a motor. I think I think I saw one. It's not that. Yeah, it's kind of expensive though. Uh, here is another idea for a demo. So he's rubbing because he's rubbing. He's doing work. So he separate the charges, and they are both charged with the same. Uh, Either it's both positive or both negative, so they repel each other. And do you see that he's holding his, uh, what, what is it, what does he have here? Gloves, so he's not grounded very good, right? So if you work in hospitals, make sure you wear good shoes, you know, with a bigger layer of insulation. Insulation, even though you can be shocked, it will um, uh, decrease the, the risk to be uh, deadly. Okay, so again, here a demo you can do. <laughs> that won't be nice for the cat, but uh, you see, you, you can rub uh, the balloon and then it's gonna stick here. Why, why is it sticking? Because of polarization. Okay, so if, um, if you have a balloon here, okay, or, or that work also here with uh, any plastic, and you you rub it against your hair, so let's say that will become a hair, so that will be become negative charge, and you can pick up little pieces here, even though they were not charged to begin with, okay, they will be polarized, okay? So it means the molecules inside, okay, that you cannot push the electrons all, all the way far away because the electrons are not free to move, but they can be moved a tiny bit inside the molecule. So this is called polarization, and what you have here, it's called a dipole. So in chemistry, you have a lot of dipoles. So for example, the water molecule is permanent. Okay, it's a permanent uh, dipole. That's why water is called a universal solvent. I wonder you're so much good, so good at uh, chemistry, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a universal solvent. Um, okay, so this is called polarization.
if, it's, if, it, if this is not a conductor, the electrons are not free to move, okay? But they can, you know, a little bit like try to move toward the plus. If it's a conductor, then all the electrons will move on one side and all the pluses will be moved on the other side, okay? So this is what's happening when you have a non-conductor. Uh, as I've said, and I'm sure you know that, the water molecule is a dipole. It's always polarized. This is because oxygen loves electrons. That's why you have, you know, uh, oxidant, antioxidant, whatever you have, like it's called um, antioxidant, for example. Everything of the sort is due to a transfer of electrons, right? So oxygen loves electrons, so it's taking the electrons away from hydrogen. So hydrogen becomes positively charged, and those uh, oxygen here will become negatively charged. Make sense? Because one hydrogen has one electron. So you have a minus two Q, and here you have a two Q. Okay, and then if you do more advanced chemistry, you learn that actually it's about probability. So you will have more probability to find the electrons around that oxygen that you have around the hydrogen, right? Okay, so this is called charging by induction. You see now it's a conductor, okay? So it's the, the, the electrons will be free to move because it's a conducting material. So all the electrons will be pushed away, okay? So that will become plus, that will become minus, like I did for the demo. And if you ground that side, then it will become positively charged. Is that clear? So this is called charging by induction. I invite you to open your textbook and uh, you, you you have a lot of demo you can do. This is called the electrophorus. Okay, so you can learn how it works. You can do a demo, you can build one. You know, it's not that hard. You need a catch or, or a fur or long hair. And uh, so it used to be before um, where people were less sensitive than today. Um, they, they use like fur, uh, cat, dead, dead cat that sacrifice themselves for, for science. So again, um, road killer, yes, you can go on the road and pick one and you say, okay, that's for science. <laughs> I you won't work with iguana, right? Because I don't think they have hair. Now, usually, you know what they do now? They they do a rabbit rabbit hair, and and uh, they don't show you that it's rabbit, right? Because here you can see the tail, so so people don't uh, freak out. So, but but you don't have to use a cat. You can use just a sweater. It works also. So you don't need to to kill your cat. So Van Graaff generator. Uh, you see, if you go to Boston, the Science Museum of Boston, it, it was donated to the to the Science uh, Museum. But before that, it was used for uh, experiment, like a um, accelerator, particle accelerator, because it has such a huge voltage, okay, that you can use that voltage to push the protons, right, to accelerate proton, okay, and it's still used today for uh, research. But now those here are found in the Science Museum. Okay, so charge distributions, uh, it's found everywhere, especially if you are in biology or chemistry. So for example, the water molecule is a dipole. You can use charge distribution in your computer to store memory. So, for example, if your battery dies, they, they have like a technology that it will still be alive for a while because information will be stored in, into those uh, capacitors. Okay, so you can use like, for example, if this is charged, that could be uh, one. If it's not charged, it could be zero. So, one, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one. Okay, it's information. It's used across cell membranes, as you have seen, sodium in or out, calcium in and out. It's used in printers, 
Okay, so the way it works, I will show you in another side, but uh, slide, but it's used in there too. Heart, the, the heart is an electrical system, so it will become a dipole at some point. So one side of the heart will be positive, the other side will be negative. So you have a voltage across your heart. Antennas use also charge going up and down, up and down, up and down. CCD or CMOS, you know, those uh, digital sensors that you have inside your uh, smartphone, for example, also use chargers. Uh, Founders cloud, so you have a cloud here. If this is positively charged, then the ground will become negatively charged. So then you have a huge voltage between the cloud and the ground. And if the voltage is high enough, then you will have lightning, okay? Because the air will be ionized. And once the air is ionized, you can have current flowing into the ground, okay? And of course, if you uh, learn about chemistry, you have this molecule here. Do you know what is this? So, huh? Yes, so a molecule of soap and they, they have a tail and a head and the head is polarized. And because it's polarized, then it will have a lot of affinity with water and the tail will have affinity with dirt and that's how you can break down the dirt. Okay, so that's how it works. So let's do, um, let's go. Did I show you everything I wanted to show you? Yes, okay, so let's do some math now. Okay, so Coulomb's law. So Coulomb's law, it's gonna um, give you the, so do you remember when you had two mass and two mass repel each other, right? So, but for the charges, either they can repel each other or they can attract each other. That force, this electrostatic force, is called Coulomb's law. So that here, number two, is going to attract number one, and number one is going to attract number two. So here is an equation I just gave this morning to the calculus-based class, and I'm sure, I'm sure they got, uh, they gonna half, half of them will get wrong. If this one is double discharge. Okay, so for example, here I have plus 2Q and here I have minus Q, so they're going to attract each other. What can you say about the force if you remember Newton's third law? Remember Newton's third law, when you push something, you're going to be pushed back. Exactly. So typical conceptual question, even on the MCAT, they're going to try to trick you. They say, okay, this one has more charge, this one has less charge. They're going to attract each other. Which force is the largest? They will be the same, okay? Because you cannot push harder than you are being pushed, and you cannot be pushed harder than you are pushing. For every action, there is an opposite and equal reaction. Okay, so the force is the same. But then when you do your free body diagram, you only look at one of them. Okay, so this force here, which is called Coulomb's, Coulomb's uh, law, okay, this force is, what do you think it is? Uh, let's, let's try to, let's say you have Q1 and Q2. It should be proportional to what? Of course, the product, so when in physics, when you build an equation, it's always you multiply if it's proportional, and sometimes you have exponent. If it's inversely proportional, that means you're going to divide. So you see, it's going to be proportional to the product of Q1, Q2. And you don't want to do favoritism, so it's going to be Q1, no exponent, and Q2, no exponent, right? In front of that, you're going to have a constant k. Okay, so this is called the electric constant. So you have the number in your equation sheet. And is that a big number or what? 10 to the 9. 9 times 10 to the 9. It's a huge constant. It's called the electric constant. So what does it mean? It means that the electric force is very, very, very strong. It's 
It is what is holding us together. Okay, all the molecules inside our body, it's glued together thanks to this electric force. Otherwise, we'll be uh, falling apart. Now, if you compare that constant to the gravitational constant, like, the, you know, there is a force between the moon and the earth, and you also have a constant, and that constant is 10 to the negative 11. So it's very, very, very small. So it means I can defy gravity. It's very easy. Gravity is very weak. But you see, if I try to rip my finger apart, it will be very hard, right? Why? Because it's the electric force that is... Uh, holding my finger together, right? Everything is glued because of this electric force. So what else? Um, if they are very close to each other or far away, what's going to happen? If you bring the charges away from each other, what's going to happen to the force? Decreases, right? So it means I'm going to have it at the denominator, except there is a square. So it means it's an inverse square law. Remember from last semester, so it means if you have your two charges, if you multiply, let's say the, the, the force is uh, 16 newton, okay, plus and plus 16 newton, they repel each other. If you multiply the distance between them by two, the force will be divided by four. Very good. So the force will be instead four newton. Is that clear? Now, if I do the opposite, so it's 60 Newton, and now I divide by 2, so the force will be multiplied by 4. So it will be 16 times 4. Okay? Also, typical conceptual question. So it's called the inverse square law. It works also with gravity. Okay? So if, my, if you have a truck 400 pounds on Earth, Okay, so at uh, the distance to the center of the Earth is R. And if you put uh, this truck in orbit around the Earth at a distance twice the radius, now the weight will be only 100 pounds. Okay? So that's called the inverse square law. Unit of charge is the Coulomb. You already know that. The electric constant here is 9 times 10 to the 9. Usually, charges will be in microcoulomb or nanocoulomb. So, micro is 10 to the negative 6. Nano is 10 to the negative 9. It's in your equation sheet. That will be the charge on an electron or a proton. Okay, it's the same charge. Electron is negatively charged. Okay, so here you can see that the inverse square law works for anything involving a field. So it works for gravitational field, it works for light, it works for radiation, like uh, nuclear radiation, it works for electric field, and it works for Coulomb's law. Okay, and you can see why here. So if you have a light, so that will be your source, you see that light will spread out over that unit area. And if you multiply the distance by two, the same light will spread out over four times the area. Okay, because you have one, two, three, four. And how much light you're going to get here will be divided by four. If you multiply the distance from the source by three, the amount of light that you get from the same unit area will be divided by nine. Okay, so it's very important in physics, the inverse square law. Uh, you can see it works also for the Earth. Okay, so if your weight here is one, um, 180 pound, no, that 200 pound. Okay, let's say your, your weight is 200 pound. You multiply the distance by two, your weight will be uh, 50. Yes, 50. Okay, 200 divided by four, right? Okay, so what do you think here? Oh, oh, we have to, um, well, we have to think here. Let's think. Uh, 
Yes, what did you say? Same, same, same. Yes, yes. So it's proportional to Q1, Q2, and the distance square. If the charge of both particles are double, so this one is multiplied by two, and this one is divided by two, and the separation between them is also double, so that means that here, okay, because it's square, it's going to be multiplied by four. So two times two is going to be four times four at the numerator times four at the denominator, so it's going to be the same. So that will be the answer. If you have issues understanding how to do that, the way you can do it is you give yourself numbers. So for example, if you are taking an exam, typical uh, with these types of problem, you give yourself numbers. So it doesn't matter uh, for the charge. Q1, for example, is one coulomb. Q2 is one coulomb. And so that's a trick, okay? It's like a SAT trick, R equals one meter, okay? And you say you don't care about the constant because we are looking at the ratio. So the force will be one times one over one square. So that will be one Newton. And then you say, okay, what's gonna happen if Q1 equals two coulomb, Q2 now equals two coulomb, and the distance equals two meters. So now the force will be two times two divided by distance square is four, so it's going to be one. Okay, so it's uh, so here it was um, so it's the same thing one newton. So that's that's the way you want to do it if um, if if algebra is an issue. Otherwise, you can do it algebraically. Okay, is that clear? Because we are talking about ratio. Okay, let's do just a numerical example. So this is called the Bohr model, okay? So it's better than the pudding, pudding model. So we uh, Bohr model says here you have the nucleus and the electron is in orbit around the nucleus. So here you have the hydrogen atom. So one proton, one electron, and the electron is in orbit, which is, which is not the the truth, right? I mean, if you, if you can improve the model and then you have orbital and you have probability, but it's just an approximation. So in that case, can you find the force between the electron and the proton using Coulomb's law? So this one is going to be attracted, and this one is going to be attracted. But I just want to find this force here acting on the electron. Okay? So how do we do it? So F equals, that's the electric constant, so 9 times 10 to the 9. The charge of an electron is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. Don't put a negative sign, okay? I'm just looking at the magnitude. And then you have 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 for the proton. And then the distance between them, you have to be very careful with the TR, you have to frame the denominator. And then you square that. Okay, so what do you get? I'll show you only once with the TI to make sure that everyone knows how to use the TI. So you go nine and then second comma, that will be your base 10, nine. You close the parentheses. To multiply, you don't need to put a, a times here. You just do this. So 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. And then you can square it. Or you can keep going. Okay. And then you do enter and then you divide, open the parentheses, and you do 5.29 times 10 to the negative 11, and then you square that. Did you get that? Hmm?
So that's your constant here. So this is the electric constant here. This is uh, 9 times 10 to the 9. And then, then there is a lot of units. So the charge of a proton is the same as the charge of an electron in magnitude is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulomb. And I'm looking at the magnitude only. So did you all get that? 8.23 times 10 to the negative 8. So you want to make sure you know how to use your TI. Did you get that? I have to be careful, okay, because if you don't frame the denominator, uh, you're going to have something called pandas, and it's going to multiply, and then it's going to divide. So make sure you frame your denominator. Are we okay or no? Everyone? I can do it again, but... Yes, everyone? So you see, 9 times 10 to the 9, Q1 is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 90. Q2 is the same charge, so that's why you have a square over the distance square, and you should get something like this. And again, this is an approximation. It's an approximation. I'm going to skip that. Okay, now something interesting. You're going to have um, a proton and an electron. Okay, at a distance, at a distance d, we don't care about the distance. So if they don't give you a distance, you can give yourself a distance. Let's say the distance is one meter, because they're going to ask you to find a ratio. So they want you to compare the gravitational force between the proton and the electron and the electric force between the same proton and the same electron. Okay? So that will be the gravitational force because two masses attract each other. So that's the uh, Newton law of gravitation. So that will be the gravitational force G is a very small number, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. You want to compare that to the electric force. Okay, so you plug it in. They don't give you the distance, so it means the distance does not matter, so you can give yourself the distance. Okay, so the distance could be one meter. I see people spacing out. Don't space out. Stay with me. Um, so electron. So what do we know about the electron? What's the charge of an electron? 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. We are looking at the magnitude. So even though it's minus, I'm just going to hide this. Uh, what else do we know? The mass of an electron, 9.1 times 10 to the very good, kilograms, okay? What about the proton? So the proton, uh, the charge is the same, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. The mass, it's uh, 2,000 larger, is 1.7, 1.7 times 10 to the negative 27 kilogram, okay? So that's why in the mass number, in the periodic table, you don't care about electrons, you only care about neutrons and protons because you see there is a ratio of 2,000 between them. So you have M, M1, one, uh, this is 2. So M1 is the electron, M2 is the proton, and they're going to attract each other. True or not true? Yes, because they have a mass. Can can do you think that mass can repel each other, or they always attract each other? 
They attract, right? The moon is attracted by the earth. You don't see the moon flying away because the earth is, uh, I don't want you anymore, you know, go find another earth, <laughs> right? So gravitational uh, force is always attractive. What about an electric force? Can it be uh, repulsive? Yes, if you have minus and minus, it will repel each other, or it could be attractive, plus and minus. But gravitational uh, force will be always attractive, yes? Okay, so gravitational uh, force will be uh, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11, okay, times m1 times m2 divided by the distance between them. And because we are comparing force, the distance doesn't matter. So I'm going to make my life easier. I'm going to say the distance is one. Okay. Now, what about the same proton here or electron and the same proton here? Are they repelling each other or attracting each other? Proton and electron attract. So that's a gravitational force, and that's an electric force. And we're going to use the same distance here, one meter, and we're going to find the electric force. So the electric force now is going to be. 9 times 10 to the 9, Q1 and Q2, and this distance is the same. Okay, the goal is to find the ratio between the electric force and the gravitational force. If the ratio is big, then that means you can neglect gravity when you are working with charges. Okay, you can forget about gravity when you are working with charges, right? Let's see what we find. Uh, proton, so what did you find for the first? Okay, so 6, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11, okay, times the mass of an electron, so that will be 9.1. Um, it's a times. You have to check if I'm doing it right. Minus 31, is that right? Times 6.7 uh, times 10 to the negative 27. And you get that number. Did you get that? Yes. You sure? Y yes. So it's going to be, make sure I didn't do mistake, right? Oh, you see I did a mistake? Yeah, 1.6. Oh, it's 1.6, 1.7, or 1.6. Okay, so let me know what you get, uh, so I don't have to do it again. So what do you get? 7 times 10 to the uh, negative 11 times the mass of an electron times what? 1.6 or 1.7, I think. It's times 10 to the negative 27. About, okay? It's, Something like this? Do you get something like this? Right? No. Okay, tell me what you get, okay? Because it's hard to do it on the phone, on the computer. 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 on turn times 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31st on turn times, what is it, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 27. Okay, I get uh, 10 to the... Ten times to the negative? 
68, did you get that? Yes, 9.7. Trusting you guys. <laughs> did you get that? Yes. No, do it. Newton. So it's, you see, it's a very small number. Did you get that or what? Okay, I'm going to do it again because I don't get any answer here. Minus 11. Okay, times 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31st until times 1.6 times 10 to the negative. Is that 27? Okay, so you get that crazy number. Yes? Okay. Okay, now let's find the el electric force. Let's find the electric force. 9 times 10 to the 9 times the charge, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 90 times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 90 over 1. So what do you get? Three times yes, yeah, okay. 2.3 times 10 to the negative 28 Newton. Okay, so can you see how, how this one is so much smaller compared to this one? Can you see that? So if you want to find the ratio, let's find the ratio. Okay, how do we find the ratio? You divide, you divide the big one. So that will be the large one. So it will be 2.3 times 10 to the negative 28 enter divided by 9.7 times 10 to the negative 68. So you get a, a ratio of 10 to the 40 about. So what does it mean that the electric force is 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 39 times larger than the gravitational force. Yes. Is it always the electrical force which is gravitational? But if you do it all the way, you're going to have a negative. Okay. So it means that the ratio between the electric force and the gravitational force is always, in that case, proton and electron, is about 10 to the 40. Okay, so it means a 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, da, 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 40 times larger than the gravitational force. You see how it's done? So it's like uh, something that you have to keep in mind when you do computations and you want to find the ratio, you divide. And if it's not given to you the distance, it means that the distance, distance does not matter. So you can give yourself any convenient distance. Okay, because we are comparing for the same distance. So that's why when you are doing electrostatics, you're going to neglect, you're going to neglect uh, gravity. Okay, so now let's review physics one. Kind, kind of. Just adding vectors, okay? We'll, uh, we'll just stay on one dimension. Okay, so... How, how do we do this one? So you have three charges and they are not moving because they are pinned. So like they are glue. And they want to find the force on Q1. So it means you're going to focus on Q1. What's going to happen to Q1? So you can like, like we did for physics one, we're going to add we're going to add vectors. So you can help each other. And let's see. OK, so the first thing you do, I, sh I, I show you the methodology. So 
So the first thing you do, you isolate what you are interested by. So I'm interested by Q1. Do you agree? Okay. And you want to make sure you have your um, charges just underneath to understand if this is negative. You see you have a minus, this is plus, this is minus. And then on Q1, I'm going to look at what's going to happen because of Q3. Do they attract each other? Do they repel each other? They're going to they're gonna attract each other, right? So I'm going to trace a force here, and I'm going to call that force F1 and 3. Okay? So this one is attracted by that one. And then, because we have to decide which way it's pointing to. So this one is pointing to the right. What about this one? Do they attract or repel? Okay. Attract, but you see it's going to be smaller. It's going to be a smaller force because the distance here is larger and the charge here is smaller than this one. Okay, so it's going to be here, but you're going to see, we're going to do it algebraically. Okay. So once you have done that, second step, you have your x-axis. We're going to say to the right is going to be positive, to the left is going to be negative. And uh, like in physics one, the sum, so you are looking for the sum here, the, the, the sum of all the forces. Uh, these are vectors, okay? So you need to add those two vectors. Okay, um, so along the x-axis now. Okay, now I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you how to do it first. We, we need to find the magnitude, and then we will decide if we have to subtract or add. So remember from physics one, if someone is pulling you with five newton to the right, and someone else is pulling you with two pounds to the left, so what's going to be the resultant? 3 to the right. So everything happens like you have only one person pulling you to the right with 3 pounds. So that works the same way. But let's find the magnitude first, okay? So we do it step by step. Find the magnitude, okay? Not the sign yet, not the x uh, component, just, just the magnitude. Can you do the magnitude here? What's Coulomb's law? So you have 9 times 10 to the 9. Okay. Q1 is 3 times 10 to the negative 6. Q2 is going to be 7 times 10 to the negative 6. Okay. Yes or no? And the distance square, what's going to be the distance? 15 square. Okay. So remember, micro. Each time you see a micro, it means you can replace that by 10 to the negative 6. Each time you see a nano, nano is 10 to the negative 9. Okay, so do that and let me know what you get. So this is a magnitude, okay? So what you get? Okay, so with your TI, you do 9 times 10 to the 9, close the parenthesis, and then 3 times 10 to the negative 6, close the parenthesis, and then 7 times 10 to the negative 6, close the parenthesis, enter, divide by, open the parenthesis, 1.15, and square, and you get that. Did you get that? Do you all agree? Yes? Okay. So that will be the magnitude. Let's do the same thing for 1, 2. Find the magnitude for 1, 2. 1, 2, 2. Or 2, 2, 1. So you do the same thing, okay? Just the magnitude. So what do you get? So what do you get? Two point 
7 newton, very good. So you have 8.4 to the right, 2.7 to the left. What's going to be the resultant? Hmm? X component will be to the right is positive, to the left is negative. So what you get? 5.7 Newton. Okay, so what you are doing, height minus left. Okay, so that will be the force. Okay, uh, that charge will have to react to. So if it's starting from rest, it will accelerate to the right. Okay, yes. Are we ignoring the negative um, seven the force one on three because we established that the rain is positive? What is the negative uh, what? So when we do the magnitude, you know it says seven times ten to the negative six. Are we ignoring the 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 negative seven times ten to the negative seven? Yeah, because here it's just the magnitude. Oh that's right. Okay, because one, this is easy because it's one dimension. But if it gets in two dimension, when you have to find the X component and the Y component, it's easier. You start with the magnitude and then you add the X component, then you add the Y component and you find your uh, vector. Okay, is that clear? Okay, so this is because uh, this is the x-axis. So again, you have 8.4 to the right, 2.7 to the left. So the, the resultant will be 5.7. So again, if, uh, if someone is, uh, you know, it's like we did in uh, physics one, you know those, like for example, if someone is running, and uh, to exercise, and there is a parachute here. They, they, they have those kind of things. So you have a force here to the right, a force to the left. So as long as right is larger than left, that, that person will accelerate. When they are equal to each other, they're gonna move at a constant speed. Okay, so this is the same idea. Okay, you, you need to add the vectors. These are vectors, a force is a vector. Okay, so let's let's have some fun. And and I remember in test number two you have things like this. I tell you those who are in biology but take physics with calculus. They are suffering right now. <laughs> That's much easier. Yeah. Mm. When we did the last question, we were done to the power of negative six. Uh, yeah. yeah, because it's micro. Micro means 10 to the negative 6. So you have ping pong. Okay, so first you draw. Okay, you, you bring you bring all the information in a, in a drawing. So 10 centimeter, you convert that to meters, so 0 0.1 meters. Okay, uh, one is positive, so I'm gonna put a plus here. The other one is minus. Uh, here is 15 nanocoulomb in magnitude, so minus here, and here you have 12, Nano coulomb. No, no, no. Uh, it's the opposite. 
this one is negative, this one is positive. So they're going to attract each other, right? So that will be two, one, one, two. So you see the force is the same. So now you just choose um, Coulomb's law, right? So first thing, you always, 9 times 10 to the 9, you use your TI, you open the parentheses here. And then Q1, so magnitude, okay? I'm going to find the magnitude. Yes. Mm -hmm. Here? Yeah. That's a distance, 10 centimeter. That, that's minus, it's a negative, minus 15 nano. And one nano, you always replace it by 10 to the negative 9. You, you see in, uh, also in biology, you use micro and nano. So that's going to be uh, 15 times 10 to the negative 9. And then you have 12 times 10 to the negative 9. And then you have the distance here, which is 0 0.1 square. Okay? That goes by that if you want, or you use your TI. Let me know what you get. Make sure you know how to do it. Like the only challenge is to use your TI. So make sure you know how to use your TI properly. That's the only challenge there is, okay? And when you multiply, you have parentheses here glued to each other. That will be multiplication. You don't need to put them times. I get that. Did you get that? Okay. So 1.62 times 10 to the negative 4 Newton in magnitude. So if it's not in magnitude, this one will be negative and this one will be positive, but the force is always the same. For every action, you have a reaction. Yes. Did I what? No, so here, nano coulomb, I have a 10 to the negative 9. Nano coulomb, I have a 10 to the negative 9. And the, there is a trick here because you have 10 to the 9 times 10 to the negative 9. It's going to be uh, 10 to the 0, it's going to be 1. Okay, but you don't have to worry about it. Okay, you can just do 9 times 10 to the 9 times 15 times 10 to negative 9 times 12 times 10 to negative 9, you will get the same thing. Now, it's just a trick that if you see 10 to the 9 times 10 to the negative 9, it's going to be 1. Okay, so you can remove it. But if you don't want to do that, don't do it. 10 to the 0 is 1. Okay? You should still get the same thing. Any question? So the trick is, each time you see nano, you're going to remove the sticker and put 10 to the negative 9 instead. It's like a sticker. Uh, let's see. Any question? Would it be different if they were both positive or they were both negative? It's uh, so a good question. So if if they were positive and positive, the magnitude will be the same, except that the direction of the force will be opposite. So, but the magnitude will be the same. So here they attract each other. Here they repel each other. Right. So they they are pin. So we we like holding in our hand. 
So it's like one balloon is negatively charged and then you have another thing that is positive charge. But if you let go, of course, they're going to crash in each other, to each other. Here they're going to touch each other and here they are repelling each other. Like the demo I did. Okay, it's just like here we suppose that they are pin. You are holding them in your hand. Okay, let's do this one. Ooh, that's algebra. Yay! Let's do algebra. So you can help each other. It's a nice review for math. Okay, so as long as they're going to touch each other and uh, it's uh, the same sphere. So once they touch each other, they're going to hold the same charge. So let's say you have one which is charged positively and one is charged positively because they touch each other. Okay, so the charge will be the same, so Q1, Q2. So they don't say if it's negative or positive, but it doesn't matter. As long as they have the same, they are like charge, that means they're going to repel each other, right? So they're going to repel each other. So that will be F1 on 2, and this one will be 2 on 1. So these are vectors. And the distance here is 12 centimeter, which is 0 0.112. Okay, so the force is the same. For every action, you have a reaction. You have the distance, and you are looking for the charge. And the charge is the same. So you have Q1 equals Q2 equals Q. Okay, so this is, this is algebra. Okay, so you can help each other. So the force, the magnitude of the force equals 9 times 10 to the 9, okay, Q1 times Q2, but they are equal to each other, divided by the distance square. Okay, so the force will be 9 times 10 to the 9, and here you have Q times Q, so how, how much is Q times Q? 2, exactly. So it will be 9 times 10 to the 9, and here you have a Q square, and here you have 0 0.112 square, and the magnitude here is given, is uh, 3 times 10 to the negative 5 Newton. Okay, so at that point, physics stops, and uh, algebra takes over. Okay, so you have 3 times 10 to the negative 5 equals 9 times 10 to the 9. And then here you have Q square. And then you have 0 0.12 square. And I like to frame so it's easier. Okay, where is your algebra? skill. Okay, so you, you can cross, multiply, divide, get the top. Okay, cross, multiply, divide, get the top. And then you isolate Q square. Okay. Okay, this is just math. Nothing to be afraid. You cross, multiply, divide. And then you divide both sides by 9 times 10 to the 9. You frame. Okay, do it with your calculator. You frame. Up, up. You, uh, you have Q square, and then you take the square root. You see how it works? You cross, multiply, divide, get this uh, uh, algebraic expression here. Hmm? Yeah, 6.92 times 10 to the negative 9. 
Did you take the square root? Six point. Do you want me to do it or you're good? Okay, you have to frame it. Okay, so three times ten to the negative five. Okay, times zero point twelve square. Okay, divide by open the parentheses nine times ten to the nine. Enter. And then you take the square root of that, so square root of, here we go, 6.93 times 10 to the negative 9. So that will be Q. And 10 to the negative 9 is, no, no, very good, so 6.93. Nano Coulomb. Okay, so this is algebra. So you, you want to make sure you know how to use your TI. Okay, any question? Make sure you frame. Framing is all about framing. Okay, okay, let's try to do, uh, this one is the same, uh, I mean, to make sure you know how to do the math. It's, it's not, it's not really physics here, it's just math. Yeah, uh, this one, the, the next one, this one, do this one. Make sure you know how to do the math. And I always have for the, I think, test, I think it's test number two, I always have like one like this. So we don't know if it's positive or negative. We don't care. What we know is that the charge is the, is the same and the same uh, sign, right? Because it says they repel each other. one on two and this is f two on one so make sure you know just to know that you know how to do the math six times ten to the negative five equals i'm going to frame that nine times ten to the nine and then you have uh, Q square, and then you have the distance, so 0 0.15 square over 1. So make sure you know how to do it with your TI. Okay, so it's going to be 6 times 10 to the negative 5. So you cross multiply, divide. So here you have 0 0.15 square, okay. Enter. And then you divide both sides by 9 times 10 to the 9. So divide by 9 times 10 to the 9. Enter. So here you have the Q square. So Q square equals 1.5 times 10 to the negative 6. 16, sorry. So then you take the square root. So you do square root is here. So second square, and then you call back the answer. So you go second minus. And I get that. Did you get that? Okay. So it will be 1.2 times 10 to the negative 8 Coulomb. If you want to have that in nano coulomb, can you get me that in nano coulomb? So you want to know how many nano coulombs goes into that? Uh, it's it's gonna be twelve, no? Twelve. 
12 nanocoulomb, right? You can divide by, you can divide by 10. So that's 10 to the negative nine. Okay, to see how many coulombs fit in, you divide by 10 to the negative nine, you get about 12. So 12 nanocoulomb. And multiple choices, sometimes they will be very tricky. Convert to nanocoulomb, they will put 0 0.12, for example, just to uh, confuse students. So here it's 12, because you divide by 10 to the negative nine, how many nanocoulomb goes into it? Okay, we survive. Uh, 